Space, stop the state of Connecticut occurred right on this spot. Here's Bernard Mullins with the daily 6 o'clock edition from the WTIC Newsroom, brought to you tonight by Griffin, the greatest name in shoe polish. Hello, everyone. Well, Hartford this afternoon suffered one of the greatest catastrophes in its history. And during a matinee performance of Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, the big tent suddenly burst into flame and burned to the ground, causing more than 100 deaths and unestimated casualties. WTIC's George Bull and myself were on the grounds within a few minutes after the congregation had leveled the big show, and while smoke was still rising from the horrible mass of canvas and poles and bleachers. That's right, Bernard. According to eyewitnesses witnesses at the scene, the fire started at about 2.33 after the show had been underway a quarter of an hour, and we were on the grounds about 3 o'clock. Bernard, what was that story that the woman survivor told you there? Well, she was a lady from Meriden, George, attending the show with her six-year-old son. Fortunately, they were seated near an exit at the far end of the tent and managed to escape. Her little boy was seated directly in front of her in the sixth row. The first indication of anything wrong came when the fire, the cry of fire was heard, and immediately a wisp of smoke came from the side wall near the front entrance. This lady pushed her youngster off the seat, and as he landed on the ground, she told him not to rush, but to keep going toward that exit. They were among the first dozen or so out. Yes, and that wisp of smoke developed in a matter of seconds into a blazing inferno. In fact, in two and a half minutes, the entire tent was enveloped in flames and had collapsed. An eyewitness in an office across the street told us that it appeared almost like spontaneous combustion, and so quickly was the big tent a mass of flames. From all reports, there was, of course, panic as thousands tried to push their way to exits at the far end of the tent. According to eyewitnesses, there were a number of soldiers in attendance, and The boys made a concerted effort to try to keep some semblance of order. But the crowd was so hysterical and the flames were spreading so quickly that a great many were trapped at the far exit. Yes, George, and if you noticed, although the fire was said to have started near the main entrance, the worst result seemed apparent near the far exit. I recall that near what must have been the northeastern exit, the breaches were burned to a crisp. Chief of Police Halsey told us that 60 bodies were removed from that spot alone. I understand that the show had been underway but about 15 minutes. An official of the show told us that the Flying Walendas, world-famous aerial act, were performing on their trapezes at the top of the tent when the fire broke. We were told that they escaped. How, we don't know. George, what were some of your impressions as we arrived at the scene amid those smoking ruins? Well, Bernard, when I saw the big tent completely gone and put my hand in my pocket and felt the three tickets that I'd purchased for tonight's performance, I felt heart sick with the parents and relatives who were standing about not knowing what had become of their families. The spot where the tent had been was a charred mess of poles and wires. Policemen and firemen were still searching among the debris for bodies. And here and there were groups of blanketed forms beyond the need for care from the countless doctors and nurses who worked about the place. Huge animal cages made of heavy iron were twisted and overturned. We overheard one of the circus workmen say that None of the animals were harmed. Fire apparatus was all about it. It was on the scene in a few minutes after the fire broke out. And ambulances of all kinds were directed in and out of the scene by what seemed to be the entire Hartford Police Department, regulars and auxiliaries, and plenty of police from surrounding areas, too. Judge, I'd like to say a word about those ambulances, if they could be called such. To me, it was an outstanding display of the cooperativeness of Hartford organizations. There were store delivery trucks, moving vans, army trucks, all rushing to the scene and carrying off those blanketed forms to hospitals. Upon learning that the dead were being taken to the state armory, we drove over there, our police passes working magic through the congested traffic. When we arrived there at 4.30, we counted 100 bodies, and there were more coming in. We've just been told that the bodies of 123 unidentified children are still there, in addition to countless numbers of adults whom we saw. We contacted every official around, including... Police Chief Hallisey, War Administrator Mosley, who had his entire organization out, and minor circus officials. But we found that they knew little more than we did. One circus official said there was nothing combustible at the spot where the fire started, and they were at loss to know how it could have happened. The half of police have requested that persons who have taken lost children into their homes should remove them immediately if they are in condition to be moved. To the Brown School, if the children can't be moved, notify the police of their identity. Yes, the children's situation was pathetic, Bernard. I understand, though, that uh, 
20 children, 10 from the West Middle School and 10 from Arsenal School who had been sent out there from summer child care centers, and their teachers were all uh, gotten out perfectly okay, and they're back home now, and all the children are fine, which is uh, exceptionally fine news for those uh, kiddies. And the, uh, the circus uh, helpers, uh, I know we saw plenty of them around the grounds there and working so hard, they uh, toppled over from fatigue, they were cut and bruised, and uh, would topple over, and their friends would have to pick them up and uh, carry them to a waiting ambulance. Well, the Hartford Hospital has requested that no one visit the Hartford Hospital this evening unless a regular patient is critically ill or unless you have been notified to do so. Now, please do not call by telephone or visit the Hartford Hospital tonight unless it's absolutely necessary. The hospital also advises that no further volunteer help is needed tonight. American Legion Post Commanders in Connecticut have been requested by their state commander to stand by for possible assistance for relief in this afternoon's disaster. Keep tuned to the station for the call if it's necessary. The blood plasma donated to the Hartford County Blood Bank two years ago is being supplied to all Hartford hospitals by the Red Cross for the relief of persons burned at the fire. This plasma was collected for civilian use in the event of air raids that never came. But thank God they kept it for this. It's been kept ready for instant use. It's been a horrible tragedy today. The final figures are not out yet. They won't be known until later, nor the exact cause of the fire, of course. It's a tragedy Hartford will never forget, and every one in Hartford hopes will never be repeated. Well, folks, I haven't had a chance to prepare my usual loot test tonight. In fact, I haven't been in the mood to do it. So I'm going to hand it over now to Russ Dollar, who will carry on with the news of world affairs. Ladies and gentlemen... The Honorable Raymond E. Baldwin, Governor of Connecticut, who will talk to you concerning the Barnum and Bailey Circus Fire. Governor Baldwin. A serious accident has happened at the circus this afternoon. But everything is being done to take care of the injured and to identify those that may have lost their lives. And I urge you all to be calm. Just remember this. Hysteria will only add to the confusion. It will only prevent us from doing everything that we can do to take care of the injured and identify those that are missing. The state police, the Hartford police, the state guard, and local units of the Army have been mobilized to handle the traffic and to help with the disaster. Help has come from our local hospitals and from our state institutions surrounding Hartford. The Red Cross is mobilized at once and the nurses' aides have already arrived on the scene. There has also been adequate medical help, and everything is being done to take care of the injured, to remove those who may have lost their lives, and to identify missing persons. The Connecticut War Council has been mobilized in the state armory to receive calls concerning missing persons. The number is Hartford 70181. If there is any person missing from your home and our family, call Hartford 70181. Have you that number? Hartford 70181. Of course, there will be a great many calls, and I urge you to be patient. When you call, give the full name of the person who may be missing. Now, the children who have been separated from their friends or parents who were with them at the circus have been taken to the Hartford Police Station, where they can be identified. The injured have been removed to the local hospital, St. Francis, the Hartford Hospital, and the Municipal Hospital. I urge you to be calm with reference to that and not burden the hospital with innumerable calls. If a person is missing from your home or family, call Hartford 70181, the Connecticut War Council, and give a name, the name of that person. The dead have been taken to the state armory. I say again that adequate, adequate medical aid and equipment, nurses and doctors have been summoned, and are on the scene. I urge you all again to be calm. I know how hard it must be for many of you, but just remember this. Hysteria 
will only confuse our efforts and will mean delay. It will delay our help to the injured, and it will delay our efforts to identify missing persons. Now, if you have a person who is missing and you call the state armory, you may come to the front door of the armory, where arrangements have been set up so that uh, calmly and uh, with care you can uh, identify uh, possibly someone who may be missing from your home uh, or may have lost his or her life. If you have no person missing from your home or from your family, please stay away from the armory, and please stay away from the scene of the disaster. Remember, people who go there just through curiosity will be standing in the way and retarding the efforts of those who have people who are missing from their homes. So help your fellow citizens by being calm, by staying away from the armory and the scene of the accident unless you have some person missing from your home. And if there is someone missing from your home, I ask you again to call Hartford 70181. Again, let me say to you that everything is being done to take care of the injured and everything is being done to identify missing persons. Again, I say... Let's have no hysteria over this thing, because hysteria will only retard our efforts. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from the Honorable Raymond E. Baldwin, Governor of Connecticut. We've been listening to broadcasts originally heard on July 6th, 1944, on WTIC Radio. We heard announcers George Bow and Bernard Mullins describe the scene at the circus grounds just minutes after the fire broke out. We also heard Connecticut Governor Raymond Baldwin's radio address to the state made on the night of the disaster. These archival broadcasts, which came to us courtesy of Infinity Broadcasting and CBS radio station WTIC News Talk 1080, illustrate the shock felt by the people of Connecticut when they heard about the circus fire. It is believed that the final death toll, including those who died of their injuries weeks later in the hospital, was 168 people. 72 are believed to have been children under the age of 18. This program is dedicated to the victims, their families, and to the survivors. The circus came to town With the elephants and clowns The air was thick like cotton candy that day It was July 6, 1944 The local boys were home from war in Hartford The day the circus came to town That song was written in 1994 in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Hartford Circus Fire tragedy. The song is called The Day the Circus Came to Town and it was written and performed by Mike Kachuba. Joining us now in the studio to discuss the circus fire is Don Massey. He's the author, along with Rick Davey, of the book A Matter of Degree, The Hartford Circus Fire and the Mystery of Little Miss 1565, published by Willowbrook Press. Thank you for joining us, Don. My pleasure to be with you today. How did you come to write this book? Well, you know, it's interesting. It took Rick Davey nine years of his own personal investigation to solve the case. And then we got to know each other in 1991, and it took us another nine years to decide to write the book. And ultimately, the joint purpose was to ensure that the historic record was, in fact, presented to the public in the way that it should have been all along. Okay, well, let's go back for anybody who's maybe not familiar with the details of the Hartford Circus Fire We could talk about some of the basic things that happened that day. Uh, I understand that the circus arrived in Hartford the day before, Mm -hmm. and I guess they missed their first performance, right? Yes, they were late on arrival and frantically trying to set up for the matinee, but that was absolutely impossible. So they ultimately scratched that performance, and they did an uneventful evening performance that Wednesday night. And then Thursday, July 6th, the afternoon matinee, 
uh, was unfortunately, tragically uh, blighted. I've seen different estimates. Do we know about how many people were, were attending the circus that day? You know, about is the key word because there is no extant public record or circus record which certifies beyond a reasonable doubt how many people attended. The range goes from seven to 9,000. We guesstimate roughly 8,000, of course, given that it was prime wartime just 30 days after the D-Day invasion. The largest majority of people attending were, in fact, women and children. Now, with regard to the show itself, I guess the show started uneventfully, right? This was the matinee show. Yes, indeed. It was set to start at 2 o'clock. They were running late, and uh, the actual matinee began at approximately 2.30. And... Do we know what was going on on the, oh, on the in the on the rings? There? Oh, indeed we do. The uh, the circus was like a military operation in its performances. They uh, they always started the same way. The clowns came out and entertained for a short time, warmed the audience up, and then of course, <clears throat> excuse me, May Kovar, who was uh, one of their two primary uh, animal trainers, came out with her cat act, and that cat act was extraordinarily popular. And it was virtually complete, as in our book we describe the fire beginning. So if I may, uh, if I could just sort of, as it were, set the stage of this circumstance. During every performance, the CAT Act required that certain cage shoots, if you can envision a cage, but rounded across the top, roughly four feet high, those bars were set up so that they could be brought all the way into the center ring, allow the cats in from the outside where they were stored, into the ring to perform. And then at the conclusion of that cat act, they would go out through the same cage chutes. And then the cage chutes were, they, they could be broken down. So at the end of the act, they were moving through the chutes, uh, going out back out to the uh, wagons. And it was then that the chaos began. And ultimately those cages were... Uh, a death trap for many people. Do we know at about what time the fire broke out? That is uh, a two-part question, if I may treat it as such, because the fire was noted to have appeared on high on the sidewall canvas at approximately 2.40, which is the time of the conclusion of the CAD Act. It is our assertion, primarily Rick Davies' assertion uh, as an arson investigator, that the fire had to have been already fully engaged prior to its first appearance high on the sidewalk canvas. And the circumstances for that were as follows. The large canvas tent, which is known as the Big Top, was not the only tent set up that day. There was also, just outside and to the right of the main entrance as you as you come into the tent, a contiguous, side-by-side, separate, smaller men's room tent. And the men's room tent allowed for means and opportunity to set a fire. And it is Rick Davies' professional assertion that that's exactly what occurred. And there is evidence from the witness statements that we obtained from public record. The coroner's inquest made it very clear. All the witnesses who came forward said that they felt very extreme radiant heat at their backs long before the arrival of the uh, first breakthrough, the first ball of flame, which was really no bigger than a, uh, a grapefruit at that point. So the fire had to have been raging long before it broke through. Uh, and I, I guess we, we didn't really mention that. Uh, Rick uh, worked for the Hartford Fire Department for many years and, and was an arson investigator. Indeed. Uh, he started on the line as a firefighter, uh, knows fire intimately, spent uh, ultimately from beginning to end 25 years with the department, uh, retired two years after this uh, investigation was uh, uh, concluded and publicized. We, we spoke with uh, one of the survivors earlier today mm-hmm. as part of this documentary, and uh, he indicated that there was a lot of confusion, which which I guess you would expect. I, I think, weren't there some cases where people thought that the, the fire initially was part of the show? Or, or Oh, yes. Yes, that's a, that's a, a um, I've heard experts say that uh, that is sort of uh, human reaction, that uh, uh, we first reacted with disbelief, uh, and especially the, the circumstances in which they found themselves. It was, after all, an entertainment environment, and uh, Uh, The last thing on their minds was that something potentially lethal, life-threatening, could have occurred. 
So uh, it must be part of the act. And in reality, people sat there transfixed by the flames uh, for several seconds. I, I would say it probably felt like an eternity, but maybe 15 seconds was long enough for that small grapefruit-sized flame to rise toward the tent top and become uh, virtually a raging inferno. Because tragically, the tent top was, and this is one of the many historical ironies about uh, this Ringling Fire, by virtue of the government's need for waterproof canvas in the European theater of uh, the war, uh, Ringling always asserted that it was virtually impossible for them to obtain waterproof canvas, which was also fireproof. It became very clear in the inquest testimony that there was no available canvas which was both fireproof and waterproof. What Ringling did every year in what they called their sail loft, because these are in fact large pieces of canvas similar to uh, huge sails from a three-masted ship, they would go to their sail loft in Sarasota, Florida, and they uh, had a canvas captain who mixed up a uh, batch of waterproofing material and brushed it onto the canvas, and it dried, and ultimately the canvas became waterproof. Tragically, that uh, material was made of 6,000 gallons of white gasoline and 1,800 pounds of paraffin wax. And when you put that mixture together, that canvas became uh, basically the world's largest wick. And by the time that ball of, of fire from the high on, high on the sidewall canvas reached that tent top, it instantly was set in, uh, on fire, and it spread like wildfire from one end of the, the big top to the other. And, of course, as anybody who's ever lit a candle knows, the minute flame reaches wax, wax liquefies. So, basically, 8,000 people were running for their lives. Uh, the heat was extreme, rising to 2,000 degrees very rapidly. And from the heavens, as it were, opening up above them, they were basically being burned on their bodies by napalm as it fell up from above. It was a tragic, tragic event. So it was truly hell on earth in, inside that tent. Indeed. Now, uh, I guess we, we talked a little bit about the, the animal shoots and other obstructions to people getting out. Maybe you could discuss that a little bit more. Sure. Uh, one of the natural human compulsions uh, is to leave from the entry space where you came in. And that decision led to more deaths and serious injuries than could have, should have happened. When the fire became both evident and lethal, people were scrambling down from these bleachers. And that's another circumstance that uh, your listeners need to know as well. When we enter an entertainment space today, we are accustomed, all of us, to uh, fixed seats, um, be they concrete or bleachers or whatever, but they are indeed fixed. These were nothing more than uh, folding chairs, similar to what you might have in your backyard for a barbecue. And tragically, they were also painted multiple layers of uh, lead-based paint. So the minute the uh, flames from above started to touch the bleachers, they would ignite almost as if they were match heads. So these people were falling through folding chairs. They were, some of them, using those folding chairs as if they were machetes to get people out of their way. It was a mad scramble to escape a fiery death. And ironically enough, uh, and tragically enough, many people ran for the very front entrance as opposed to doing the very simple thing that would have saved their lives, that is, go down to the edge of the canvas and crawl out from below. We'll have more of our interview with Don Massey in a moment. But first, a survivor recollection from Tom Manning. Tom Manning lived in Rocky Hill and was 12 years old when he attended the circus in 1944. I went with three sisters. And we, we were, my father took us up uh, in a... Yeah, my father drove us to the, to the circus. What do you remember about um, uh, arriving at the circus and, and uh, the period of time leading up to the fire? Do you remember anything from that? Well, I just remember it was one heck of a hot day. That much I remember. And, uh, you know, the excitement of going at 12 years old. Yeah. And uh, it was just, we were, fortunately, we were poor. <laughs> we couldn't afford a good ticket, very good, and we bought tickets at you know over there, so we just had to wait in line. I do remember that sort of thing, but uh, uh, not much else before the circus. Now, uh, do you remember where you were sitting when you got inside the tent? Yeah, we were sitting right next to the band in the far 
farthest away area from the fire, so where the fire started. Um, what, what the man you, was at one end, and the big opening was on the other end. What do you remember about the the fire itself? Or did did you know it was a fire at first, or it was a lot well, of confusion? Actually, the circus they they had just uh, started the circus. <clears throat> just began actually, and they had the aerial people were up on up top. Everybody was uh, making a lot of noise because it was just starting up, and suddenly it just became eerily quiet, and that's what got my attention. I was, remember that as plain as day, and I'm 72 years old now, and I looked up for some reason, and you could see the flames going up the side of the tent onto the roof, and at that point, uh, all hell broke loose, really. Uh, I just remember we, we were... We were probably in the best place in that in that tent for that because we were as, as far away from the fire as you could get. We had an opportunity to. <clears throat> the band was still playing, but the fire was moving toward us pretty fast. And I can just remember we had to jump down. We were probably two thirds of the way up on the on the bleachers, and. We could get part way, part, part way down, and then we were right near an exit, so we were able to jump into the exit. But there were people everywhere, and that—that that was the time we were in the tent. Um, now, when you got outside the tent, uh, uh, what did you do then? Well, if, I, as I remember, first thing I did was look around to see if everybody was—we were all together. Was, I think there were three of my sisters and myself. And just, I was youngest, next to the youngest. I can't remember. My youngest sister was with us, and I, but uh, I was just looking for the rest of them. And I can remember the tent just collapsing, well, actually burning. And uh, within, it was so fast that it's hard to believe. It, it don't. Uh, it did, I don't know. It just seemed like it. It was two or three minutes, and that tent was gone. So people didn't have a lot of time. But I guess it was longer than that. But it didn't seem very long to me. Yeah. You know, uh, it, we can, I can remember seeing people being carried out. One little girl was, was in somebody's arms. And she, her skin was all burned, and not very good memories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now you got out. Uh, were you now everybody in your in your group got out okay yes, they did. Mm -hmm. and now um, how did you get home or, or what did you well, do my father was waiting for us at, at uh, a place in Hartford and my, my older sister we, she really got us out of there pretty quickly I, I don't remember a lot after the fire except we were on Barber Street and or some street right up there and there was a cast iron wrought iron fence where they started putting the bodies I can remember, remember seeing that and then we got to a bus and we got to hard, down to uh, Albany Avenue where my father was supposed to meet us but in the meantime he heard about the fire and he was at the circus park he was at the fire looking for us so he had heard about it and he, he had was... heard about it and he was he was there and we went the opposite direction so he was, I think, in a more of a stress situation than we were because we knew where we were. Yeah. He didn't. And I can remember the ambulances and the fire trucks and the, all the, it seemed like thousands of uh, army vehicles heading towards the fire. They were, I don't know what they were, they were like uh, these six by sixes they used to have for the transporting servicemen around. There was tons of those going towards the fire. And uh, we were, I would guess, where we were on Albany Avenue was uh, right near the intersection of Albany Avenue and North Main Street, so everything went by there. And it, it just seemed like it went on, for, on and on, sirens going on forever. We've been speaking with Tom Manning about his recollections of the, of the 1944 Hartford Circus Fire disaster. And thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Broadcasting as a community service of the University of Hartford, you are tuned to 
WWUH West Hartford, and WDJW Summers. We return now to our interview with Don Massey. Don discusses the efforts of the Hartford Fire Department to fight the fire on July 6, 1944, and also discusses allegations of negligence against the city of Hartford for failing to take measures which might have lessened the impact of the fire. The fire department was called very early on, but again, by the time they were called out and the nearest station was on Barber Street, by the time the uh, first crew arrived, a number of things came together to prevent any meaningful intervention. First of all, the inferno had virtually destroyed the circus tent itself. It's important in context to remember that the entire conflagration lasted no more than eight and a half minutes. So from the time the first flame was recognized on the sidewall canvas, a mile of canvas was destroyed. The circus was burnt to smoldering rubble in eight minutes. So the turnout crew, the first crew that arrived on the scene, and there were several in sequence, they saw nothing left but smoldering rubble and burning bodies. Uh, I hope you don't mind my mentioning it. So they did what they could to save the people, realizing that the the circus itself had been destroyed. And um, there were, tragically, a number of people who had gotten caught at the cage chutes and um, were piled upon each other. And their bodies were, by virtue of the immense heat, to which it, they were exposed, uh, were burning. And so many of those first arriving crew members uh, turned their hoses on that human life and saved a number of people from the bottom of that stack who would not otherwise have survived. That's incredible. If I may add one thing to your question about the fire department, there are a number of things that are historically true and important to mention. But one is that the city of Hartford did not do a final inspection prior to the performance. The Hartford Fire Department did not order, John King being the chief at that time, did not order any apparatus or crew to stand by prior to the, to, to the uh, matinee or any of the evening performances. The other issue which becomes important is that the Ringling Circus asserted that they had pumper trucks which would be able to address any fire that might occur. But, in fact, their couplings were not standard, and they didn't match the hydrant couplings. And the fire department had not done an inspection so as to know that the nearest fire hydrant was still too far away for any hose lines to make it in. So they relied on their pumper trucks when they arrived. It was a... uh, a confluence of circumstances which was tantamount to contributory negligence. There was additional negligent conduct on the municipality's part as well because prior to the performance, there was at that time and is now a statutory obligation for any performing entity to present a certificate of insurance such that they would be insured against uh, or for all liability in that performance. And Ringling did not present any such piece of insurance, and yet a permit was granted by the city of Hartford's police chief in exchange for 50 free tickets to the circus. We'll have more of our interview with Don Massey in a moment. But first, another survivor recollection from Ray Boudreau. Ray Boudreau was 13 years old and lived in Newington when he attended the circus in 1944. One of our neighbors uh, and her daughter, uh, the the three of us, uh, attended the uh, circus that day. Do you you remember anything um, in the beginning of the show or or just arriving there or or anything before the fire started? Well, not really. uh, All I can uh, remember is actually... uh, of that day. I knew it was a hot, sunny day, and that was about it, but uh, uh, the only thing I really recall was the uh, beginning of the fire on that particular day. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, the circus uh, tent was a rather large oval tent uh, with the main entrance at one end and an exit entrance at the other end, and uh, the fire uh, started at the in the in the roof of the uh, main by the main entrance, and it, as it started, all I could see was a little bit of sunlight coming through the roof of the tent, and the whole sun area 
kept getting larger and larger, and then black smoke started coming, and there were a bunch of aerialists that were up on <clears throat> up on the uh, trapeze things up on top of the tent, and they all started scurrying down the ropes, and the tent was starting to fill with a lot of black smoke up on the top. So you you knew at that point that something was wrong, uh, or or were you still kind of thinking maybe it was part of the show or something? Or well, we were just kind of sitting there thinking some you know it was going to go away or you know it wasn't going to be a, a, a real big deal. But as the longer we sat there, we could see that we were having a real problem that day. Um, now, how how did you where where in in relation to to that were you sitting? Do you remember where in the tent or anything? Yeah, we were at the other end, which was lucky you know lucky for us. And uh, people on on one side of the tent were were able to come out exit the tent where we were. You couldn't go out the main entrance because the fire was there. And on the other side of the tent, there was a oh a a, a channel like that brought the animals into the uh, arena area <clears throat> to perform and in order for people to get out of the tent on that side of the tent to come down to us they had to walk over this channel where the animals were there were no side rails or anything that I can recall and these people would walk up you know, trying to get over this channel, and they get up on top, and they would be pushed over and fall, and uh, you know, it was just pure bedlam for them trying to uh, get out. And the uh, tent was, you know, strong canvas, and I guess treated with with uh, paraffin, and it went up like a a real can a candle effect. Yeah, and uh, very. Quick uh, fire when it, once it really got going. Do you um, do you remember? I guess how you got out or? or uh... Yes, we were sitting like I say, and it was all bleachers in there. We were sitting at the uh, far end of the tent where the you know from where the fire started, and I remember the band was sitting there uh, over across the. Uh, uh, exit area, and they were playing, I guess, what they call a disaster march. And when that tune plays, they all the circus employees know that there's a big problem, and they, you know, come in to assist. And they, uh, just a lot of confusion at at that time. So we just sat there in for a few, you know a few minutes trying to see if you know it would be the condition would be gotten under control and it just kept getting worse and worse so we decided we would try to uh, get out and uh, we get, get, went out through the exit area and by this time the fire was really going so we kept going through a wooded area just to get away from the tent and uh, as I recall Somehow we got uh, through all this wooded area and went into a little store to try and call home to let uh, you know people know that we were okay and the phone lines were jammed, nothing was going through. Yeah. And there was an elderly couple sitting in that store waiting for an ambulance, and both of them were pretty badly burned on their arms, flesh kind of hanging off uh, there, and they were hopefully waiting for someone pick them up and take care of them yeah um now do you remember um now well so everybody in your group got out safely right um now do you remember um the rest of that day uh as the news of the fire was spreading around and and i i guess then you went home or what where did you go how did you get home and well my uh my father was uh, working that day at uh, Pratt and Whitney, which is, and uh, the news was getting out that there was that big fire, and he knew I was at the at the circus that day. He left work to try and come and uh, find me, and uh, the police weren't letting too many people in, and uh, but he happened to know a police sergeant that day and was talked to him, 
told him that I was there, so he let my father come in. To, my father never found me that day, but he said it was, you know, just scary going around seeing what what these people look like, yeah. and trying to hope hope that I get out of the fire all right. And once I, like I say, the last thing that I remember about the fire was being in that little store that day, trying to make a phone call to home to let them know that I was okay. And after that, it's like a uh, complete blank. <laughs> yeah. It ended there. Mm. Well, uh, we've been speaking with Raymond Boudreau, uh, formerly of Newington, Connecticut, and he attended the uh, circus the day of the fire. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. We return now to our interview with Don Massey. Don discusses the case of Little Miss 1565, a young girl who died as a result of the fire, but who remained unidentified for decades. The evidence indicates that uh, as it relates to one particular child who essentially became the metaphor, the symbol for the community's grief in this catastrophe, uh, Little Miss 1565, she was ostensibly recognizable because she'd only had a small char mark on her left cheek. She was, unlike most of the bodies that were being removed, um, indeed recognizable. Some had been charred beyond recognition. And those who are still listed as unidentified at the municipal cemetery in Hartford, they were not possible. It was not possible, would never be possible to recognize them as human. And um, that is why they remain unknown. But in this particular case, uh, there was a circumstance where a family member misidentified the body. And she went to her grave without her name and was known for 50 years as Little Miss 1565. And now, weren't there some Hartford detectives? Uh, I, I think Barber and, and yep. Barber uh, and Lowe, two very dedicated men who were in fact uh, municipal cops at the time of uh, of the blaze, and they worked very very hard that night and the next day to try and, and identify this uh, young child. And uh, their commitment to her and the attempt to identify her extended throughout the balance of their lives. Uh, three times a year, they would go to her grave and place flowers on the grave as a um, memorial to this child who, in their opinion, as dedicated men, should never have gone to her grave unidentified, especially uh, as a human being who was largely recognizable. And their commitment is something important, Rick and I believe, to municipal history, and we wanted to honor them for that, and uh, as, as well they should be. And there were some people who uh, continued, uh, Charlie Barr also continued this after uh, uh, Detective Barber died. So the commitment to this kid was, uh, was extensive in this town, and uh, ultimately she was identified and returned to her family. That's also a, it's a major portion of your book, the, A Matter of Degree, which you co-authored with, with Rick Davey. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk a, a little bit about how you and Rick investigated this and and came to the conclusion. Uh, and and uh, I know you spoke with the families and indeed, and yeah. The process of uh, of identification was uh, in largest measure done by Rick himself during the nine year investigation that he undertook, a reinvestigation of the uh, fire and the circumstances surrounding it. And ultimately, he came to the conclusion based on photographic evidence uh, and ultimately talking to the uh, family members that he was able to locate that the medical examiner actually had. We have in the, uh, in the book uh, and the, the documents that we have in, in our file, which are all public record, make it very clear that Sam Freeman, uh, a state trooper, had acquired within 24 hours of this child's death eight different individuals in the public, uh, from nurses to uh, the medical examiner, who all asserted that Little Miss 1565 was indeed Eleanor Emily Cook. And yet, within that 24-hour period, they could not get a family member, specifically Emily Gill, the child's aunt, to uh, assert um, l legally, in other words, make an absolute certification based on family knowledge that, in fact, it was her niece. And the uh, contention was that she did not remember how many teeth her niece actually had. She asserted that she had eight permanent upper teeth. Well, for a child that age, eight years old, it is not possible to have 16 permanent teeth. 
So she had made a fundamental error. The evidence from the medical examiner was she had four permanent teeth, upper and lower, making a total of eight, which would be appropriate for a child that age. What uh, Rick Davey used, along with that documentation, were family assertions of the fact that this child was shorter for her age than most young females, and the reason for that was because she had had rickets. Her bone development and teeth development were, in fact, retarded, delayed, in other words, and um, all of which were in keeping with the family's assertion that, in fact, that was their uh, niece. What made the identification virtually impossible at the time was that what most people don't know is that this child and her two brothers, one older, one younger, were actually living with their aunt and uncle because the family situation was such that dad had abandoned uh, the family. Uh, Mom entrusted her three children to her uh, brother and sister-in-law. She came to Hartford and uh, were two jobs for the purpose of reuniting her family when she earned enough money. She had bought new clothes, which no one other than she had seen. She uh, prepared for this by uh, squirreling away enough money to buy the tickets, which, believe it or not, was a lot of money back then. Four dollars for a ticket was a ton of money. And um, she prepared for this event as if it were one of the biggest celebrations of the year, and indeed it was. So they go to the uh, matinee. And um, she is uh, enjoying the circus, as are the kids, and when the fire breaks out. The oldest son, Don, who is nine years old at the time, decides rather than going down the bleachers as mom and the two other kids are going, he's going to go up and over the bleachers. And it is because of that decision that he survived. He went out and was taken home by another Hartford family. Then mom was carrying her six-year-old son, Edward, and holding on to her daughter, And the long and short of it is that the uh, stampeding crowd uh, ripped the child from her arms. Her daughter was lost in this sea of people and was uh, ultimately trampled and brought to the hospital unknown and would remain that way because mom was burned over 75% of her body and was found in virtually a coma with her child in her arms, lying in the sawdust together. And they were taken to municipal hospital. He was forcibly pulled from her arms because she did not want, as she came in and out of consciousness, didn't want to uh, let him go. And he died the next morning. She remained in a morphine-induced coma for 30 days because of pain and suffering and uh, remained in the hospital for five additional months. So by that time, her daughter had been lost and unidentified. Her young son had died, and her other son was living in East Hampton, Massachusetts. So it was a confluence of circumstances that left this child unidentified. We're going to take a break from our interview with Don Massey now to hear some more archival audio from 1944. Station WTIC presents the Governor of Connecticut in a report on the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Fire in Hartford on July 6th and the measures taken to meet this disaster. His Excellency, Governor Raymond E. Baldwin. Good afternoon. Nine days have passed now since the terrible disaster of the circus fire here in Hartford. On that hot July afternoon, at least 6,000 persons had gone to the circus to attend its matinee performance. It was a merry crowd with many children. The circus performance had begun. The animal act had been completed, and a troupe of aerial performers had mounted to a platform high under the big top when the cry of fire went up. The canvas tent was burning. In a very few minutes, the fire swept across the entire area of the tent. The burning canvas with ropes, poles, and other gear fell upon those who were unfortunately trapped in the arena. Thousands made their way to safety, but the casualty list is long, too long. As of today, 162 persons have lost their lives. There are 113 persons still receiving treatment in the four hospitals in Hartford, and the condition of seven of these patients is still considered critical. There were lesser injuries to many persons who were treated for their burns at hospitals or by their own physicians. The total casualty list may be in the neighborhood of 500 persons. Our state health commissioner and the city health officer of Hartford are making a thorough check of this final figure. In lives lost, And in personal injury, this was the worst disaster in the history of Connecticut. 
many homes and many communities have suffered grievously. We have a tremendous depth of sympathy for all these persons who have been injured and for the families of those who lost their lives. A thorough investigation is being made to determine how and why this tragedy occurred. If any criminal negligence or neglect is involved, everything in the power of the state will be done to bring to justice those who may be responsible. These investigations are in the hands of competent authorities. The results in due course will be made known. It is my chief purpose here today to report to you on the emergency measures that were taken when this disaster struck, and to express the thanks and appreciation of the state to the many, many individuals and agencies that gave prompt and generous aid. The response of the people of the state to this emergency was magnificent. The spirit of helpfulness and sympathy that was shown throughout was splendid. There was no panic. There was no confusion. The emergency services of the state were organized and they functioned well and swiftly. This was the Connecticut civilian defense machinery that went into action on Thursday afternoon, the 6th. The State War Council, the State Police, the American Red Cross, the State Guard, the Hartford War Council and its Citizens Defense Corps, local police and firemen, doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, air raid wardens, Boy Scouts, telephone operators, messengers, we had all the volunteer help that we could use, and these volunteers were trained. They knew their jobs. All the time and work and thought that has gone into the organization and training of civilian volunteers for the handling of a disaster have been justified by the events of these past few days. We have given ample evidence of the wisdom of these preparations. If any members of the protective organization have been inclined to doubt the continued value of their work, they have seen a telling demonstration, not only of its value, but of its necessity. These volunteer forces were organized for protection against enemy attack, a bombing raid which has never come. But a bomb attack could not have struck more swiftly, and with less warning, or with more cruel force, than this circus fire. The injuries, indeed, were much the same as could have been expected in any enemy raid with incendiary bombs, for example. Many severe burns and a smaller number of fracture cases. We regret the tragic event that called the emergency organization into action. We shall always be grateful that it was ready for the job. In wartime, the normal protective forces of the community are necessarily weakened by loss of manpower. Hospitals are understaffed, and there are fewer doctors. Police and firefighting forces are below their peacetime strength. Volunteers must help, as they have done in Hartford. And to be ready for disaster, the organization of volunteer forces in civilian defense must be maintained. Now let me take you back to Thursday afternoon, nine days ago. Our Commissioner of State Police, Colonel Edward J. Hickey, as it happened, was in the audience at the circus. Colonel Hickey is a former administrator of the Connecticut War Council and the active head of its fire and police protection services. Outside the tent was a radio car of the Hartford Police Department. When Colonel Hickey had made his way from the burning tent with the children who were in his charge, the alarm had been sent by radio to the Hartford Police Headquarters. Firemen and additional police had been called, and ambulances were on their way to the circus ground. The state police had been notified. Chief Hallisey of the Hartford Police Department and Colonel Hickey, in a hasty conference at the radio car, determined that all civilian defense forces would be needed. The magnitude of the disaster already was apparent. Through the Hartford Police, the Hartford War Council was called into action. The emergency ambulances from department stores, factories, and trucking companies were called. The emergency medical services of the city were summoned. Colonel Hickey called me at my office, told me that the state army would be needed to receive the bodies of the dead, and that all civilian defense forces within reach of Hartford were required. 
General Reginald, Reginald B. Delacour called units of the State Guard and directed preparation of the armory as a morgue. State War Administrator Henry B. Mosley and Ed Edward N. Allen of the American Red Cross reached the scene and conferred with Colonel Hickey. In the meantime, the injured were being taken to hospitals as fast as the ambulance, ambulances could go back and forth. The municipal hospital near the scene received the heaviest load. The first patients were admitted at 245. Extra doctors and nurses, equipment and supplies of plasma were rushed to the hospital. Army trucks began the removal of the bodies to the armory. Here, General Delacour's staff and the staff of the State War Council had already made preparations for the melancholy task that lay ahead. When persons seeking lost members of their family reached the State Armory, there was little waiting and there was no confusion. They registered, giving their names and the name of the person they were seeking. Mimeograph forms had been run off for this purpose in the short time before the doors were opened. Girls were ready at tables and at typewriters to record this information. Persons were admitted in small groups. A nurse's aide and a policeman walked with each grieved relative and assisted in the search. When a person was identified, the medical examiner completed arrangements for a release. A record of all this information has been kept by the War Council. Outside, a state, a state police sound truck assisted greatly in maintaining calm. Persons waiting in line were informed in many instances that their children or other relatives had been found safe and there was no need for them to stay. The rolling kitchen of the Hartford War Council served coffee and sandwiches. The Red Cross canteen unit fed the workers inside the building. Nurses helped those persons who were overcome, and there were restrooms and cots for them. Clergymen of all denominations came to the armory to give what aid and comfort was possible to the grief-stricken. The Salvation Army was there and set up water coolers. Uninjured, uninjured children, separated from their parents, were taken by the Hartford police to police headquarters and to the Brown School. The State War Council sent a stenographer to the aid of a lone teacher trying to record the names and addresses of the children at the school and notify their parents. All of these children were recovered by their families within a very few hours after the disaster. Throughout the afternoon and evening hours, we received continuous assistance from the radio stations of Hartford in broadcasting information to the people, telling them where to report the missing and identify the dead, reading lists of persons who were known casualties. The first public call for ambulances went out by radio over this very station, WTIC, eight minutes after the first box alarm for fire apparatus had been sounded. A special radio appeal for donors of type O blood on Saturday night, on Saturday, brought 100 offers in a very few hours. Newspapers with special editions and columns of space devoted to information of the disaster aided greatly in bringing essential information speedily to the anxious people of the state. The work of identification has not yet been finished. Possibly it may never be complete. Of the 127 victims who were taken to the armory, seven are still unidentified. There are six persons listed by the State War Council as missing in the disaster. The list of missing persons at first was extremely long. War, Administrator, War Council Administrator Mosley estimates that 10,000 calls and more were, were received at the State Armory during the 24 hours after the disaster, and approximately 2,700 persons were reported missing. As they were found, their names were taken from the list. This was the most pleasant task of those grim days. Persons were located in many ways, through telephone calls, through the aid of local war councils in their hometowns, by special visits of police. It is perhaps impossible to mention every agency that has given aid. Broadcasting as a community service of the University of Hartford, you are tuned to WWUH West Hartford, 
and WDJW Summers. You're listening to WWUH West Hartford, a community service of the University of Hartford and WDJW Summers. And now back to the Hartford Circus Fire, an audio recollection. From the governor's office, word was sent to the state institutions throughout central and eastern Connecticut. Doctors and nurses from these hospital staffs came immediately to Hartford, and many of them worked through the night. Girls from the governor's office and others recruited from their desks in the Capitol by the state personnel department joined the emergency force at the state armory. Units of the state guard were called and were on duty. Police departments of nearby towns sent men. The Army, both its anti-aircraft units in the Hartford area and the air base at Bradley Field, gave extremely welcome help. The First Service Command provided plasma. The Navy furnished personnel and medical supplies from its training units at New Haven and Hartford. Extra equipment for the administration of plasma plasma was sent by airplane from the Department of Hospitals in New York City. Offers of aid came to me from Governor Saltonstall of Massachusetts and Governor Wills of Vermont, offers which were gratefully acknowledged, but which there was no need for us to accept. Four Boston doctors, all with experience in the Coconut Grove fire in Hartford, in Boston, spent a day in Hartford in consultation on the treatment of the injured and the identification of the dead. Commissioner Hickey of the State Police, Administrator Mosley of the State War Council, and Mr. Edward Allen of the American Red Cross were key men in the mobilization of the state's disaster relief forces and their direction. The staff of the War Council and the volunteer personnel of the Hartford War Council are, I understand, to receive recognition for their services from the National Office of Civilian Defense. More than 840 of the civilian defense volunteer personnel, including ambulance drivers, nurses' aides, auxiliary state police, air raid wardens, the rolling kitchen crew, the hospital corps, the Boy Scouts, clerks, stenographers, and telephone operators were on duty, giving long hours of hard work. The Red Cross reports that 150 additional, additional nurses' aides reported, but were not needed. Thus, a total of nearly 1,000 civilian defense volunteers responded to the call. The Red Cross, always ready, threw all its forces into action. The hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, and their volunteer assistants have done and still are doing magnificent work to relieve suffering and to heal the injured. This circus disaster has saddened the state. We shall not soon, if ever, recover from this blow. But we can be intensely proud of the spirit with which the people of Connecticut met the emergency. There are heroes, nameless and innumerable, in this tragedy. Thank you, Governor Baldwin. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Governor Raymond E. Baldwin in a report to the people of Connecticut on the circus fire disaster of July 6th in Hartford. The broadcast you just heard came to us courtesy of Infinity Broadcasting and CBS radio station WTIC News Talk 1080. J. William Burns served as Transportation Commissioner for the state of Connecticut from 1981 through 1991, and again from 1995 through 1997. But we asked him to share some of his memories of the day of the Hartford Circus Fire. I remember the day actually quite vividly. The, I was working in a um, neighborhood grocery store at the time when a customer came in and told us that the circus tent was on fire and the tent had collapsed. Well, my younger brother was in, in at the circus that day. He and his friends had gone to work early in the morning at the railroad yards and they were given free passes to get in so I went outside I took my apron off went out and um, there was a bicycle out there out in front of the grocery store I got on that bike I don't know whose bike it was to this day and I started pedaling to go up there we were about uh, a mile away I don't know what I had in mind but I knew my brother was in there and uh, I got about halfway there when I saw coming the other way my father in a car. 
and he had all the kids um, in the car with him. So I just turned around and went back to the uh, grocery store. But it was a terrible thing in the neighborhood. The uh, conflagration had killed over 150 people, and um, many of them were neighbors or sons or children of neighbors. And uh, the, our parish priest, Father Looney, was the first clergyman on the scene, and he described it as a um, just a devastating sight to him. We've been speaking with J. William Burns about his memories of the day of the Hartford Circus Fire. In the final segment of our interview, Don Massey discusses evidence suggesting that the Hartford Circus Fire was deliberately set. That is our assertion, that in fact the Hartford Circus Fire which was originally declared to have been an accident, was in fact a deliberate human act of arson. And Rick, again, based on his years of arson investigation, and I must say a certification for that, that no arson case that Rick ever brought to trial ended in anything other than a conviction. So there is a good deal of experience which he brings to his investigation and the assertion that in fact it was arson. The rather dramatic issue relating to how it could have become arson is simply an accident of history. Ringling was, as one would expect, short-handed because of men going off to war. So, as was often the case, when a circus came to town, they would hire young, strong boys and offer them in exchange for some tickets to the show and maybe uh, a few extra bucks they would say, would you hire on and help us put up the tent and so forth. And when Ringling, which, by the way, at that time, there was only one Ringling Circus. Right now they travel with two. You can see the Ringling show. If it's the red show, it's the same as the blue show, but there are two traveling circuses at all times. In 1944, when it came to Hartford, it was one show, and it was destroyed here. And ultimately, its first city on the New England tour that summer was Portland, Maine. In Portland, Maine, a young man named Robert Dale C.G., who was, in fact, 14 years old but looked about four years older, was taller, stronger than any 14-year-old boy would normally be, presented himself to the uh, roustabout boss and said, you know, I'd like to be one of your helpers. And they said, sure, you look like the right kind of guy. And he uh, signed on, became a roustabout with them. And when it came time for the matinee in Portland, ironically enough, they had their first fire of the season. They had a small tent flap fire. Well, it was extinguished without any loss of life or property. And then at the end of that performance, Robert Dale C.G. presented himself again and said, you know, you guys are on your way to Providence, Rhode Island. I'd love to go along with you. And Whitey Versteeg, the roustabout boss for Ringling, said, uh, sure, come on. So he uh, joins the train and goes to Providence, and lo and behold, they have a tent rope fire on the day of the Providence matinee. Robert Dale C.G. is a member of the Rustabout crew. And then, of course, two days later, they come to Hartford and the conflagration occurs. Well, what makes Robert Dale C.G. the most interesting suspect in Rick Davies' mind is that long before he presented himself in Portland, he had been setting fire since the age of seven, had burned his family out of their home several times, had set probably 30 or 40 warehouse and wharf fires in Portland, Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the family would basically uh, bounce back and forth between New Hampshire and Maine, largely because of their son's fire activity. So here he comes to Ringling, and he's now a member of uh, the crew. And on the day of the Hartford event, while setting up, he dropped the light from the rigging above, and the light was damaged, and he was slapped in the face and ridiculed by Whitey, his roustabout boss. And Along with his natural propensity, which uh, upon his arrest several years later, it was found that he, he was in fact a juvenile fire setter. He was now humiliated. So when Rick analyzed all of the activities as found in the psychiatric report and various things upon his arrest, which I'll explain later, it became very evident that this, that this young man had both the motive and the means and was presented with the opportunity to set the fire because the means to set the fire was as simple as a match. The motive was and could be asserted to have been uh, revenge, uh, but it's actually more psychological than that. And the opportunity was that he was assigned to the men's room tent area 
and would have been one of the people who was going to break down the cage chutes. But to make a long story short, in 1950, after he was set free in 1944, uh, the state of Connecticut and the city of Hartford declared the fire to be an accident. He was arrested in Columbus, Ohio, for arson, uh, and uh, during his confession, or during his arrest, he made a complete and uh, total confession in great detail, including uh, uh, multiple drawings in color of how he set the fire uh, in Hartford, why he did it. And the why was simply that he had a fiery nightmare figure who would appear to him. He called him the Red Man. And the Red Man would order him to set these fires. And the Red Man appeared to him in Hartford as he had in all the other places. And as a result of the Red Man and Robert Dale C.G., we assert that uh, 168 people in Hartford died. So now this confession came six years later. Nobody knew in 1944, right? Immediately after the fire, it was About thought his to be background, a, right? Yeah. And it was it was thought at that point to be an accident, right? Yes. A discarded cigarette, or yes, yes, a discarded cigarette. One that is one of the assertions that Rick Davies arson investigation was able to refute because the photographic evidence indicated that where the state of Connecticut asserted the point of origin to exist. There was no burned grass at that point of origin. A grass fire must burn and smolder long before it takes flame. There was no photographic evidence of, at all of any uh, of any grass fire prior to the conflagration. The uh, struts, the two by four struts uh, above that point, the alleged point of origin, uh, were in fact charred. But uh, anyone knows, uh, if you've spent any time with a match and a 2x4, you could spend five days or a week trying to get a 2x4 to burn with a match. It can't happen. So the reality was that there had to have been some other means by which uh, the fire took hold of that tent. And that's where Rick asserted that the fire was done outside the tent, the contiguous men's room tent, leading to the um, fire going to the main tent. And ultimately, that's exactly how he explained it. His uh, confession was uh, recorded by the Columbus, Ohio officials, and uh, ironically enough, were, were also published in Life magazine in 1950, along with the pictures. So what troubled us in our investigation when I became uh, journalistically involved um, uh, with Rick and, uh, and preparing the book, it was very troubling to stumble upon transcripts of secretly recorded phone conversations between the Connecticut State Fire Marshal and Ohio State Fire Marshal. And those transcripts indicate that there was an active cover-up on the part of the state of Connecticut to conceal the effects of the fire, and that two state police officials were ordered to Ohio to silence this young man. And the psychiatric report makes that very clear. They did just that. Do we know why? Uh... We assert why, and it seems to us to be the most logical assertion in 1944, uh, when the state investigation occurred, the fire was declared an accident largely because of the anecdotal claim that uh, someone had tossed a cigarette into the grass. Uh, Rick's investigation made it very clear that FBI studies it made it scientifically verifiable that humidity levels that existed on that particular day and the temperature of that day, which Rick certified with the National Weather Service, and the height and level of the grass and so forth, would have made it impossible for a grass fire to occur. It was simply not going to happen. Cigarette could not have done it. And with that in mind, Rick made the claim that this investigation in 1944 was intrinsically flawed and that they, made it an, they claimed it to be an accident when, in fact, it was a deliberate act of arson. One of the consequences of that investigation was that Ringling and six of its officials were charged with multiple counts of involuntary manslaughter, and they faced not only prison time, but a massive amount of uh, lawsuits subsequent to this. $14 million worth of claims in 1944 money came in, and ultimately Ringling agreed to pay $4 million of them, $4 million, and uh, went into Connecticut based receivership as an organization here, corporation here in Connecticut. So they cooperated fully uh, to the extent where they um, even allowed their six individuals who were charged with manslaughter to enter pleas of uh, no contest without a trial. And ultimately they were sent to prison. 
How long were they imprisoned? The longest imprisonment was one year in Wethersfield State Prison. In fact, that man was uh, uh, also a member of the Ringling family by marriage and was the traveling manager for the circus. It was very clear to us that uh, you asked the question why. It became very clear to us from the public record in our private investigation that the city of Hartford, the state of Connecticut, became aware after the fact that they had, in fact, botched the investigation in 1944. A tragic event claiming 168 lives was declared to have been an accident when, in fact, it was a deliberate act of arson. The arsonist was in their custody, along with all other members of the Hartford, or the Ringling Circus, and was subsequently released. And no justice had occurred because... Although there was contributing negligence on the part of Ringling, there's no doubt about it. They made mistakes. And even if it were to happen today, there would be some punishment and some lawsuits involved. I don't want to make it seem that uh, we think Ringling didn't make mistakes. But the bottom line was that there was a balance between that negligence. And if there were a trial, there would be a defense. And if there were a defense, it would be very clear that the lack of public inspection by the city of Hartford both uh, the building inspection and the Hartford Fire Department would have contributed to the city's negligence, along with giving them a permit to perform without having received the statutorily obligated or necessary certificate of insurance. And all of these and many other things, including the Hartford Police Chiefs receiving 50 tickets in return for that permit, would not look good in a public trial. That's why there was a cover-up after the fact, because $4 million in 1944 money had been paid by the circus. We've been speaking with Don Massey, who co-authored with Rick Davey the book A Matter of Degree, subtitled The Hartford Circus Fire and the Mystery of Little Miss 1565. It's published by Willowbrook Press. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure to be with you. On July 6, 2005, the 61st anniversary of the disaster, the Hartford Circus Fire Memorial Foundation held a formal dedication ceremony for a permanent memorial at the Barber Street site of the fire. It was attended by government officials, survivors, and relatives of victims. Trees had been planted to mark the outer edges of where the giant circus tent once stood. In the exact location where the center circus ring was, a small plaza with granite benches and a path of bricks bearing messages from contributors sits at its very center, a large bronze disc bears the names of all 168 victims of the fire. What follows are some brief interviews we conducted immediately after the dedication ceremony. Mrs. Wiker, do you have just a moment? No, I do. Uh, what are your feelings today on, on the final dedication of the memorial? I think it's lovely. I think it's a lovely day. I think it's a wonderful day for the survivors and their families. And um, it's been a long time coming. And I think that perhaps now, I only wish my parents could be here. Uh, uh, they would have found, I think, some peace in this so very family beautiful place. associated with this. Yes. In fact, uh, I was quite moved because I think it was the very first time I've ever heard my brother's name spoken by someone other than a family uh, member. Thank you very much for thank speaking you. with us. We're speaking with Governor Weicker. What are your feelings today on, on seeing the memorial finally dedicated? Well, the people that worked so hard to produce this just did a phenomenal job. It's a beautiful memorial. It's, uh, it's wonderfully planned. It took off a lot of effort over the years. And really, uh, I'm sure those that they honor, uh, those that died and the survivors, will forever be grateful to a handful of people for having created this wonderful, wonderful Thank you very Thank much you. for speaking with us. Thank you very much. How do you feel uh, now to have this finally uh, be completed? Hartford Fire Chief Charles Teal. Now I feel a sense of relief. Yes. Yeah, if you had asked me yesterday, I would have honestly said um, I feel like I fulfilled uh, an obligation to uh, the survivors. And, um, but now that everyone is coming up to me saying how pleased they are with what they see, now I feel a sense of relief. I was concerned. We're with Don Massey, what are, your, what are your final thoughts on this subject? It's extremely difficult for me to say after all these years of work exactly how I feel because it is overwhelmingly moving for us to have completed the mission we began. And to see these people here and uh, all gathered for one purpose and to, to be at least part of the uh, ceremony that gave them a sense of closure and fulfillment, sadness, peace, restoration, it is more than we ever hoped for. We're speaking with Rick Davey, who co-authored A Matter of Degree, 
and was involved in the investigation of Little Miss 1565. What are your feelings on finally seeing the memorial come to fruition? Actually, I have very mixed feelings. Um, one part of me is, is very happy that it's done. The other part of me is mournful over the fact that we have to honor 168 people who died. Um, that's a huge number of souls to have lost. During the ceremony, the name of each victim was read, and after each name, a bell was rung as one of several children would take turns placing a single flower on the memorial for each victim. We conclude our program with an edited recording of this portion of the ceremony. Donald Abate, age 5. Maria Abate, 34. Gertrude Wiley Adams, 63. Elaine B. Ackerland, 15. Frederick B. Baker, 63. Gail Ann Berry, 5. Gladys Berry, 40. Mary Bedore, 13. Roy Ritchie Bell, Jr., 6. Eldora Burgeon, 18. Miss Mary Burgeon, 45. Mrs. Mary Burgeon, 75. Judith Ann Berman, 7. Rose Berman, 39. Ann L. Burgeon, 5. Arlen Birch, 12. Marguerite Birch, 36. Shirley Ann Birch, 9. Sarah Booth, 67. Alice Boyagen, 30. Frederick Boyagen, 5. Stephen Boyagen, 3. Frank Bradley, 32. Helen Alicia Bradley, 30. Mrs. Dorothy E. Brooks, 44. Miss Dorothy E. Brooks, 20. George Brooks, 9. James Brooks, 10. Miss Edith Budrick, 9. Mrs. Edith Budrick, 38. Joseph Budrick, 7. Anna Burns, 64. Jacqueline Carrier, 4. Walton E. Charter, 53. Edward Ralph Clark, 81. Emily Clark, 81. Grace Jacobs Clark, 48. Evelyn Lucille Conlin, 26. Edward Connolly, Jr., 10. Rita Ann Connolly, 13. Edward Cook, 6. Little Miss, 1565. Eleanor Emily Cook, 8. Edith Brown Cortez, 57. William Curley, age 29. Mary Cosgrove, age 53. Elizabeth De La Verge, age 33. Anna DiMartino, age 36. Joseph Dinezzo, age 3. Catherine Dinezzo, age 35. Carolyn Derby, age 6. Loretta Dillis, age 7. Anna Albina Dillis, age 36. William Joseph Deneen, age 7. Alice Duhamel, age 23. Ellen Edson, age 3. Jane N. Elliott, age 43. Richard Edward Elliott, age 6. Raymond Erickson, age 6. Grace Smith Feifold, age 47. James W. Fitzgerald III, age 3. Shailene Fitzsimmons, age 3. Louise Ford, age 80. Mary Ruster Franz, age 30. William Franz, age 3. Mary Jane Gallucci, age 5. Rose Gallucci, age 55. Margaret M. Garrison, age 69. Maurice Goff, age 24. Muriel Golf, age four. Adrian Goldstein, age three. Sylvia Goldstein, age 27. Kenneth Gorski, age five. Anne Gulko, age 36. Claire Gulko, age 17. Elizabeth Gulko, age 22. Nancy Gulko, age six. Hilda Grant, age 28. Helen Gray, age 65. Audrey Hagar, age 22. Nellie Frances Hart, age 69. Minnie Hess, age 42. Peter Hines, age 5. Ada Hall Hindel, age 65. Helen Mary Johnson, age 54. Esther Cavalier, age 39. Sandra Cavalier, age 6. Dorothy E. Kelly, age 48. Shirley Kellen, age 16. 
Helen Kube, age 44. Herbert Kube, Jr., age 7. Roslyn Crew, age 22. Dorothy Coonley, age 36. Georgiana Coonley, aged 12. Mary Coretta, aged 16. Sarah Lopak, aged 40. Senior Lopak, aged 8. Marion Levasseur, age 32. Elaine Ida Locke, age 6. Viola Ann Locke, aged 40. Sandra Logan, aged 4. Francis Markovitz, aged 4. Stephanie Markovitz, aged 30. Martin Marcus, aged 44. Jarvis Mason, aged 3. Marsha McKinney Mason, aged 35. Lola Booth Mother, aged 41. Sarah Elizabeth Mother, aged 7. Dorothy C. Matthews, aged 34. Rosalind Matthews, aged 5. Teresa E. Madison, aged 46. Marjorie R. Metcalf, aged 51. Charlotte Merman, aged 7. Monica Miles, age 6. Stephen Ronald Milliken, age 6. Martha Ann Moore, age 65. Charles Walter Murphy, age 4. Hortense Murphy, age 32. Walter D. Murphy, age 34. Valerie Jane Nogas, age 8. Agnes Norris, age 6. Eva Norris, age 43. Judy Norris, age 6. Michael E. Norris, age 50. Irene Cook North, age 49. Irene May North, age 7. Daniel O'Brien, age 7. Doris Jean O'Connell, age 5. Evelyn O'Connell, age 32. Mary C. O'Connor, age 64. Constance Pellins, age 2. Carmela Historia, age 39. Frank Poglich, age 8. Lillian Poglich, age 36. Eva Prost, age 25. Rochelle Prost, age 3. Elizabeth Putnam, age 43. Mary S. Putnam, age 9. Elizabeth Rester, age 24. Rose Terry Rester, age 27. Elizabeth Roberts, age 37. Doris Schenkel, age 21. Edwin Ralph Snellgrove, age 47. Olive M. Snellgrove, age 42. Joan Lee Smith, age 5. Syra M. Smith, age 48. Clarence Serdam, age 28. Catherine Serdam, age 73. Louis Steinberg, age 74. Vincent Testa, age 10. Charles Tomalonis, age 47. Joan Toth, age 9. Regina Toth, age 11. Laura Traver, age 39. Anna Venberg, age 52. Catherine Vences, age 61. Mildred Veering, age 27. Paul Veering, age 4. Ida Verrett, age 35. Myrtle Verrett, age 22. Anne Waybreck, age 45. Lorraine Waybreck, age 13. Anna Waken, age 62. Bruce Wakeman, age 7. Virginia Wakeman, age 33. Edith Walters, age 22. Edwin Woodward, age 54. Lucille Woodward, age 55. The final victim had no family that we know of, was never identified, and was the first to be lost uh, permanently to history. An infant without a name, victim 001. You've been listening to The Hartford Circus Fire, an audio recollection. This program was produced and edited by Brandon Camp, sound engineering by Bruce Camp. Special thanks to Mike Kachuba for allowing us to use his song, The Day the Circus Came to Town, from his album, It Happened in Connecticut, as our opening and closing music. Special thanks to all the people we interviewed at the Circus Fire Memorial Dedication Ceremony, as well as all of our studio guests, including Don Massey, Ray Boudreau, Tom Manning, J. William Burns, Governor Lowell Weicker, Claudia Weicker, 
Hartford Fire Chief Charles Teal and Rick Davey. Interviews with guests were edited for time and technical purposes. Special thanks to the Connecticut Network CTN for providing us with audio of the reading of the names from the dedication ceremony. We edited this audio to fit in the time allotted. Special thanks also to Infinity Broadcasting and CBS radio station WTIC News Talk 1080 for allowing us to use archival material in this broadcast. And a special thanks also to Jeff Huggabone of WTIC who assisted us in this project. To see the main sources we consulted in preparation for this broadcast, please visit www.uh.org. Special thanks also to John Ramsey and Mike DeRosa of WWUH Radio who made this broadcast possible. In Hartford, the day the circus came to town. In Hartford, the day the circus burned down. And now back to the Hartford Circus Fire on audio recollection. You're listening to WWUH. The forecast for the 91.3 listening area.